thank you very much um, uh, for the invitation to come here today and talk to you. Um, as you can see, uh, I work at Nesta, and I was going to talk to you today a little bit about um, some AI use cases currently in operation in UK public services, and then some commentary on developing ethical frameworks or ethical principles that should underpin that in public service organisations in the future. And it's something that at Nesta we've had a go at doing, um, and we think it's an important part of doing AI or doing data science well and ethically in, in public service organisations, but it's not necessarily straightforward. Um, quick intro to Nesca. Nesta, we're an innovation foundation. Um, we're based mainly in London. We also work around the world. Uh, we do a lot of European research and practical projects um, and some work even further afield than that. Um, in the particular team I work in, which is government innovation, one of our big areas of focus over the last four, four or five years really has been how the use of technology and data can help us improve outcomes um, from public services. And we've done that through some practical work, working with uh, local authorities and data science partners um, to test out predictive algorithms and their efficacy um, for particular use cases. We've also done a huge amount of research um, into human dimensions of um, algorithmic use in public service organisations, uh, a lot of work on data governance and trust, um, and we also have a team of data scientists at Nestor as well. Um, and I guess we're really interested in this because we've heard a lot today about the associated problems that one can encounter when using AI, um, and we're alive and, and conscious and cognizant of those issues. Um, but I think our view would be that this is uh, something that's not going to go away and is something that does have um, a huge degree of potential to improve outcomes for, for individuals and for communities. Uh, we've already heard some of the, the advantages today, so we probably don't need to go um, particularly into this slide um, and move on instead onto just a, a kind of seven use cases currently in operation um, at the moment in the UK. Uh, just to reassure you, I've ticked the a box that will share these slides with you afterwards. So if you want to um, access them afterwards, you, you'll have the chance to do it. Um, kind of, I guess, before I go into these specifics, I think it's fair to say that in the UK, um, the use of AI in public services is still fairly embryonic. We haven't seen a huge amount. Um, I think there is at the moment quite a lot of work happening behind the scenes, but which isn't talked about. Uh, particularly publicly, um, I would guess partly because often it can be perceived as, as controversial and that can ultimately become a, a kind of barrier uh, or, or a, a stoppage to what you're doing. Um, I think it's also fair to say that sometimes what's described as AI uh, by marketing teams in the UK isn't always AI. So there are some examples in here, uh, which I'll note as we go on to them, which I think I'd, you'd, be, you'd be generous to describe as AI, but do represent some form of at least advanced analytics um, or predictive analytics. Uh, so one example here, I'll, I'll start at the top, is from Harrow, which is one of the local, one of the boroughs in London. Um, and they've worked with the IBM Watson uh, machine, I guess you can call it, uh, to design an AI which provides tailored health and social care recommendations um, to people who receive health and social care budgets in their borough. Previously, they would just receive um, a list of suggested options from their caseworker. Now they get that, but they also, via a, an online portal, will get a, a much wider and more bespoke list that's generated um, by, by the IBM Watson machine in Harrow. Um, the second one, Zantura, um, is a, a predictive risk model which is being used by uh, two or three local authorities at the moment. Um, one of them has actually stopped recently using it, but it's a predictive risk model which um, looks at children's social care cases and tries to make a, a judgment of how at risk a child might be of neglect or abuse. Uh, third one, um, Google DeepMind, probably the most famous. So we had the um, use of AI uh, to identify tumours or, or 
problems in people's um, ocular scans. Uh, more recently, just published in Nature, is a similar project, but on um, for, for breast cancer tumours, um, a far more difficult uh, sort of um, data science problem that they took on there. Um, those two, at the moment, are, the, the breast cancer one in particular, I don't think is currently live, in the sense I don't think it's being used, but it's certainly uh, something that will be over time. Um, the fourth one, Babylon Health, is, well, Babylon is this kind of virtual GP surgery, um, whereby anyone in the country can register for it. Uh, and when you have a consultation, it's all done remotely. But they also have this AI-powered um, kind of chatbot, and so you type your symptoms into it, and it will uh, try and predict what kind of condition you might have as a kind of triage service to say, well, yes, you probably should be going to the GP or no, you might want to go uh, to, to the hospital or potentially there's nothing for you to worry about. In Barking and Dagenham, uh, they have used, they're using a predictive algorithm to try and identify uh, landlords who don't have the appropriate license for the house that they're, they're renting out, um, which is... Uh, surprisingly big problem in London and we have lots of issues with uh, over overpopulated houses um, where people are living in awful conditions um, without the appropriate health and safety um, protections put in place. Um, the DWP, which was mentioned earlier, they have a digital first approach now to accessing all benefit claims um, and as part of that they have an AI element that will try and predict if you're trying to fraudulently uh, claim your benefit. I'll talk a little bit about the controversy on that one um, in, a, in a second, a couple of slides time. Um, and then in, in Enfield, uh, I guess this is one that's sort of most generously described as AI. They have a chatbot which will help you navigate council services. Uh, but I, I think in reality it's really just quite a big, sort of a big decision tree um, and I don't think there's much of a kind of AI component to it really. Um, but that's just some examples of what's kind of happening at the moment in the UK. As I said, I feel there is a lot more probably happening behind the scenes and in development at the moment, but these are the ones that have, have been, have sort of gone public and have had uh, newspaper attention and are, and are kind of well known. Um, we've heard already about some of the ethical concerns. And so I think the position we have at Nesta is that we recognize that the benefit, but we also recognize the harm. And as with a lot of other innovations and things that we deal with, we try to tread uh, this fairly fine line uh, between those two positions. Um, we don't want to be uncritically evangelical about the potential of tech, and at the same time, we don't want to be uh, kind of dismissive of potentially very powerful and benef powerfully beneficial things uh, because there are uh, sort of associated challenges with them. Um, we'd much rather look for a kind of constructive middle way where you acknowledge and deal with the, the difficulties uh, and try to make the most of the benefits. We've heard already, I think, about the, the kind of issues faced, um, and I don't really need to, to go into much more detail. Um, but what we've done really in trying to generate our own set of prin principles for how public service organisations should um, use AI, and which we in turn use at Nesta with our data science work, is it, really tried to break it down into component parts. Um, and so in our kind of basic analysis, there's three bits to the three components to the use of AI that are likely to bring with them ethical concerns. You have one, the creation, how is the AI created? Two, how it works. And three, what it's used to do. And so on this slide, you can see some examples of the type of ethical concerns that you might get within each of those, within each of those categories. So on the creation side, you have concerns around uh, invading the individual's right to privacy, um, about whether the training data you're using is, is accurate, is high quality, is truly representative, um, whether it contains historical biases um, that might then be perpetuated and exacerbated by, the by AI or machine learning. Um, and then thirdly, what happens when the use of the AI, so fourthly, what happens when the use of the AI might render the training data out of date. In that second category around the function, you have questions around the assumptions being used by the AI and whether they're correct, um, whether the factors used by the, by the AI to make a decision are reasonable and fair. Uh, thirdly, around whether people can, whether anyone can see and understand how it works and audit it given 
uh, a particular and, and audit to see how a particular output might have been created. Um, and fourthly, um, how can we be sure that it's not that it's protected against hacking and manipulation? And then on the third bucket, uh, is the AI being used to do something unethical? Um, is anyone responsible and accountable for negative outcomes that it might produce? Thirdly, will people know if a decision affecting them has been made by an algorithm? And then fourthly, what recourse do people have if there is uh, an incidence of algorithmic discrimination against them? So just to return to some of those examples I gave earlier, a number of these have already provoked controversy. So with Zantura, uh, there's a kind of obvious fear that this is a tool where basically a kind of a computer is going to decide whether a child has their, uh, sorry, a parent has their child taken away, away from them. That, that is, uh, in, in my view, been misplaced. That's not how Zantura are operating and not their intention. Uh, but it's easy for those narratives to develop, uh, and particularly when, a press, when the press can see a kind of a headline, uh, a nice sounding headline, and don't really care that much for the nuance. Um, that, that's the kind of issue that can create. With Google DeepMind, um, there were pretty big concerns around data privacy and how the initial training data for the eye, um, the eye cancer uh, ha had worked and around the access that they'd been given to that by one of the hospitals in London. Uh, with Babylon, um, there were big concerns really about the accuracy of its, of its chatbot. Um, and I think it's fair to say those are wrapped up in wider um, consternation about how Babylon is operating. Uh, in the DWP's case, uh, big, que big questions about the, the accuracy of their fraud spotting algorithm. Um, in the UK, the DWP has sort of perishingly little public trust. It is uh, a department that has, is seen as um, essentially this kind of uh, Kafkaesque monolith that really just seeks to sort of punish people if you should ever need to access benefits. Um, and I think that the use of this kind of algorithm in this context has really not helped them in that kind of art, in that kind of sphere. And I think that if you are an organization that lacks public trust in the way that the DWP does, I think you do have to be extra careful with these kind of things. Um, and then I think in the, in the case of Enfield, there's a sort of general discomfort about the idea of human roles being automated away by, by robots, by computers, um, and about the sort of people not wanting to deal with a robot, people would prefer to speak to a human. Um, so you see, there isn't actually much controversy, I should say, on the Barking and Dagenham one, which I think indicates that people don't really care what happens to landlords um, in the UK. But generally speaking, if you try and do AI, uh, there will be some controversy attached to it, and people will, will have their concerns. And I think that's uh, in part because the public sector is a bit of a special case. It's a sort of monopoly provider of the service it offers, interacts with extremely vulnerable people, uh, can have sort of life and death decision-making power in, in, in times, um, and also has this sort of democratic accountability argument. And I think that makes it especially important to deal with the underlying ethical considerations. Um, so this kind of brings on to, on to the next bit of the, the presentation, which is to do with how they can approach it. Um, I'll run through a few slides here quite quickly. You'll be able to see them afterwards in the deck, but really just to give you a sense of the, the number of AI frameworks, ethical frameworks and AI principles that are being generated. This is Google's. Um, this one is from Microsoft. This one's from our, the UK Department of Health and Social Care, um, which is in theory, this is what's underpinning the use of AI in, in healthcare in the UK. Uh, this is the European Commission's. Um, this one is from Dubai. So there's, this is just a selection. There's a huge number of them. Um, and this is the one that we've produced at Nesta, which has eight points. Uh, so I will go through this one in a bit more detail. Um, so point number one is every algorithm should be accompanied by a description of its function, objectives, and intended impact. Uh, secondly, um, a description of the data upon which the algorithm was trained and assumptions used should be published. Um, if it's not possible to publish the data itself, um, and also there should be a risk assessment that is undertaken to, to, uh, so that potential biases can be mitigated for. Um, a list of all the inputs used by the algorithm should be published. Um, citizens should be told if 
they are going to be subject to decision making by either wholly or in part by algorithm. Um, number five, there should be a kind of identical sandbox version of it, which is available to auditors to test the impact of different conditions so that you can uh, really just sort of stress test it and see what it's doing and what outputs it's chucking in, chucking out from different inputs. Um, so six relates to where private sector involvement. So when normally what happens is that the public sector doesn't have a huge amount of data science capacity or, a, or AI capacity. So usually a lot of this work will be done in, in public, so in pub partnership with the private sector. Um, and in, in those cases, we would recommend that uh, those contracts should only be given out to organizations that will meet conditions one to five. Uh, seven is around accountability. And so we would argue that even though it might be a decision made by an algorithm, there should still always be a human who's responsible for it. Um, and we think that that's a good safeguard to introduce into the system because it means that you ultimately need a human who's willing to have and has the confidence to say, I will take responsibility for decisions made by the system. And then fourthly, um, and it's good to have seen some of, uh, for instance, with the um, presentation we had earlier about refugee integration, um, about that kind of evaluation of the impact and, and whether it is causing harm and is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And that's something that should happen all the way through. Um, so what can we make of these different codes, standards, principles? Well, if you sort of mash them all together, there's quite a lot of commonality between all of them. Um, this is our sort of um, uh, analysis of if you merge all of those things, is kind of what you add, end up with, uh, broken down by our three, three, three criteria earlier. But it's not as simple as just coming up with a, a framework or a set of principles. And really, the reason we think that is that uh, even within, even just trying to break it down and keep it simple, there are varying levels of complexity that will be that will be happening with an AI system. And as a rule of thumb, the more complex uh, the system, the more difficult it is to ensure that those ethical principles are being upheld. Um, for instance, is it really possible to be transparent about training data and assess for bias if it's unlimited and unstructured? You know, for instance, if it's based on thousands of hours of CCTV footage, how realistic is it in that instance to have proper transparency? And can we meaningfully talk about explainability when an AI might be based on unsupervised dynamic learning models whereby it's constantly learning um, and iterating on its, on its things, as we saw with uh, out the sort of second iteration of AlphaGo, um, which taught itself uh, to play and eventually was successful um, against the, the world's best Go player. So what we did, um, I'll kind of rattle through this a bit quickly because I'm coming up to the end of my 20 minutes, but uh, for each of the, the kind of principles, we assessed it by the, the three stages of complexity um, and I sort of looked at, well, how feasible is it? A, a tick indicates straightforward and possible. Across means hard or impossible and the sort of dash means uh, yes, but probably only in some circumstances. Um, and so as you can see, the more complex it gets, the harder it is in our opinion, to uphold these ethical principles. Um, in this instance, by the time you're on to level three, where you have sort of unlimited quantities of unstructured training data, um, it becomes quite difficult to do the kind of, trans, you know, sort of identification and minimizing of bias, the respecting of privacy, um, and also to make sure that you're not, in a sense, bringing in protected characteristics like race or religion or disability into your analysis. Um, similarly with, with function, um, it's a little bit more positive, but still you, you can kind of see this uh, a similar issue, which is the more complex it gets, the harder it is to do. And uh, in particular here with, with the sort of transparency bit, uh, you can in theory make it transparent at, at level three, but it would be basically meaningless um, to do so. Um, and, and a similar thing about, about the outcomes becomes quite hard uh, when you're in the complex world. And so where does that leave us? Well, uh, it, it suggests that a kind of one size fits all approach um, is unlikely to work um, unless you sort of pitch it at a really, really high uh, level. But if you do that, then it's not really gonna give you much uh, kind of directional steer when you get to individual use cases. 
Uh, but, but for now, that's probably okay. Um, we think that any code that's created needs to cover private sector partners providing services to government. Um, and I guess the kind of good news, and this ties into what I said at the beginning of the presentation, is that particularly in the UK, most of what we're seeing is far closer to level one than it is to level three. Um, so what we're seeing is generally pretty simple. As I said, most of it I don't think would really qualify as true AI. Um, and so for now, it's relatively straightforward um, in our opinion, to be sort of experimenting, innovating with, with data science, with AI, um, in an ethical way, in a way which enables you to make sure you are at each point in the process. Um, I think as things become more sophisticated, that will become uh, a bigger challenge. In our view, the kind of biggest unresolved issue is around explainability. Um, and I guess it's a kind of a, becomes a more sort of a higher level question um, is should we avoid instances where we don't think we can explain to someone why a decision was made um, by, by the algorithm? It's, uh, or do we have to put in more kind of human safeguards into those systems? So if there is a fundamentally a, a lack of ability to explain from an algorithm, should uh, we only ever allow those to exist in systems where the human, human has the final decision-making power? Um, a sort of point uh, which is, is made a lot, thankfully, these days, which is around the need for diverse sets of people involved at every stage of design, oversight, and evaluation, uh, both in terms of the sort of programming and engineering, but also in wider co-creation um, uh, and general involvement in these processes. Uh, and then last couple of slides is, uh, does this sort of suggest to us that we need to have more emphasis and faith on professional judgment and, and of humans. Um, but at the same time, uh, the sort of ability to recognize the human dimension um, in these things. In, uh, and for instance, we've uh, recently published a report about the human dimension of predictive analytics in children's social care and what it means to be a social worker asked all of a sudden to integrate a predictive risk model into your normal casework approach. Um, and I think that that often throws up problems which aren't necessarily acknowledged by purely technical discussions of AI or purely ethical discussions of AI. And I think there's a, an important bit around implementation and what it means uh, to trust uh, a social worker or trust someone else uh, to use an AI tool as you've intended and as you've designed. Um, and I think what we found in our research was that you can easily stray into algorithmic aversion whereby a third of the social workers we interviewed just refused to use the tool that they were given because they didn't like it, didn't work for them. Um, but you can also stray the other way into algorithmic deference, whereby uh, humans start to sort of um, lose faith in their own professional judgment um, and want instead just to, to go with what the algorithm says. Um, and so finally, just as a kind of useful heuristic, uh, we developed 10 questions for public service organizations to kind of ask themselves if they are considering using AI. Uh, this was developed by a former colleague of mine, Eddie, who likes uh, credit for his work, which you'll see why he's got uh, his name in the bottom corner. Uh, but this is um, all on our website, will be in the slide deck. But we think a kind of a useful set of prompts which you can ask yourself um, at the beginning of the process to give yourself the greatest chance of avoiding uh, kind of ethical and other other implementation issues. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you, thank you Tonya, very interesting. Uh, specific question for this presentation, yes? Hi, thanks. Um, so I feel like I'm going to apologize. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. 
the eight. Are you referring to the explainability point when you talk about inter interpretability? So your view is that it's, it is perhaps less of a negative picture than portrayed here. It is easier to do the explanatory bit, in your view. Is that, is that where you're coming from? Not in all cases. Yeah, but in more... Very nice yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the process was, um, they were developed by uh, colleagues of mine at Nesta who are, I would say, non-technical, they're more generalist. Uh, and then we, but, but based on sort of significant reading on our experience of working with data scientists um, on a lot of research and some practical work. Uh, and then we consulted quite widely um, with data scientists, with practitioners, with policy people in the field um, and we sort of published a, a sort of rough version of it in blogs, in, in a blog, and then we sort of sought consultation and opinion and sort of iterated it based on their responses. Uh, I couldn't quantify how much of that was with people that you're referring to, and I think one of our principles at Nesta is that we're always keen to learn and continue to iterate in response to feedback. So um, we'd, be, we'd absolutely welcome a, uh, you know, some some feedback from you or from, from anyone really, if you think that this actually from a, from a technical perspective is, is not accurate in some way, we'd, we'd be very grateful for that. Any more questions specific to this presentation? Yes? Um, I would say in, in central government, there's probably more data, sort of data science capacity these days. But in UK public service in general, there is not a huge amount of people with, with, this, with the skill set required. And for almost all things IT related, not just AI, uh, private sector support is usually brought in to help. Um, and it's just not a sort of skill set or competence really that exists properly in, in, the, in our public service systems. There are some people who can do it, but they, they tend to be rare. The central government uh, in, in the UK has, um, I think, made good strides towards this. And they now have a, a sort of data science um, stream of their graduate recruitment program. They've been actively trying to recruit more uh, data scientists into working in central government and I'd say well they were starting from a higher base and I'd say that there probably is more uh, in-house capacity for that kind of stuff in central government um, than there would be in local government where I'd say it's a lot like that sort of technical expertise is a lot more sparse basically but um, yeah I think almost always uh, sort of external experts are brought in and that tends to be a similar model for a lot of, um, I guess, kind of innovation projects that happen in public services in the UK, not necessarily IT related, but just, just, just kind of generally. So you mean that essentially what you're saying is <clears throat> it's all very well and good having recourse to explanation or to uh, et cetera, but by that point the damage is already done. Is that your argument? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I haven't heard it really pitched in terms of red lines, but I think that it would, I think the way we would look at it is more similar to, to how we 
heard about the refugee integration um, project earlier, which is that you should kind of start small and test and just make sure you're not sort of like there's, I guess, try and make sure that the risk of doing harm is as minimized as possible at that point and approach these things slowly and gradually. Um, I think the idea of a red line is interesting. Um, and I'd, um, yeah, yeah, I think that would be worth exploring about whether, for instance, is there, I guess you could think about it, are, are there issues that are so sensitive or where the risk of harm is so high that you would, you just think it's not like, you just decide it's not worth going at. I think that would be interesting to, to, to consider. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, well, I can imagine that uh, many of your uh, points are also uh, uh, applicable more in Netherlands, uh, whether AI or not. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, we have big companies trying to uh, classify people, uh, do risk uh, analysis, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what you said is, uh, makes yeah. us thinking it's, it's quite possible. Mm, I, think that's f I think that's a fair point. And as you say, often, sometimes the, uh, there can be a lack of nuance in the debate, which is basically, uh, you know, there's been some predictive targeting or something that's happened. And it, it is presented as if that's the first time this has ever happened. But actually, it's just perhaps a slightly more sophisticated way of doing it than would have existed in the past. Um, and I think that is a fair point that uh, the, 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 this is more a kind of an evolution, a continuation of things rather than a, like a complete uh, sort of stage, uh, you know, like a big shift sometimes. And so perhaps we should be uh, integrating these kind of um, ethical principles into more than just AI. Yeah.